1964, Soviet astronomer Nikolai Kardashev proposed that a civilization's level of technological advancement could be measured by the amount of energy it is able to harvest and use. At the first level, Kardashev placed civilizations capable of using all the energy that falls on their planet from its parent star. For us, that means the sun. The Earth only receives 20 millionth of a percent of the energy output by the sun. We're only able to harness a very small portion of that. We need to advance ourselves as a species to be better at energy production and transportation. But why would Kardashev have chosen a civilization's ability to harness energy as the primary measurement of its advancement? Because energy is the means by which humans have transformed the basic state of things, not just an unpleasant state, but a brutally inhospitable one, into a livable environment. Civilization, effectively, you could say, first commenced at the discovery and mastery of fire. Once we discovered fire, we could cook, and we could hunt, and we could store stuff, cook it for later, and not die of salmonella, and civilization took off. And it was this ability to cook which created the energy surplus that allowed us to evolve our large brains. And so human awareness itself sprang from energy, and the ingenuity which came with it has enabled us to create everything that underpins modern life. We harnessed animals, putting their energy to work for us in carrying, milling, and plowing. We figured out basic hydropower and windmills, basic steam, and as we kept advancing in terms of our sources and uses of energy, civilization kept advancing. Today, a single person in the West enjoys the energetic equivalent of 600 humans working for them. Think reliable hospitals, transport systems, easy access to goods and materials, all of it grounded in energy expenditure, making life safer, easier, and better. Every single increase in energy efficiency brings with it an advancement in human comfort, productivity, basically moves us up the advancement chain. Thinking about your life today and really thinking about it, obviously food and water are quite important, but just consider for a second what would happen to the world if we were to turn off all the power. You could probably put a big bet that five to six billion people would be dead within a week with the remaining billion dying the week following. There is nothing more critical to civilization than energy. Energy is everything. And this is why money, our main way of storing and transmitting value, is so closely linked to energy. We're gonna see a bank of stone money right there. On the Micronesian island of Yap in the 1700s, inhabitants quarried and carved rye, huge stones to use as money. They're all arranged in a row. In America, the wampum shell belts used as currency by natives and settlers required significant expenditure of energy in collecting clams, drilling them, and then assembling them into belts and pendants. The carved stones and shell belts worked as money because they existed as unforgeable proofs of the time and energy expended in creating them. And they are still remembered in today's language. Clams, for example, remains American slang for cash. 100 million clams! Woo! 100 million dollars to Mr. Darwin Mayflower. Perhaps clams and stones seem strange things to use as money, but as the Nobel-winning economist Milton Friedman pointed out, the stones of rye are not so different from how gold works today, transferring value from one government to another without ever leaving the vault. Four tons of rock produce one ounce of the most precious metal in the world, gold. It doesn't do anything. Why is it so valuable? Partly because it's rare, so it's in limited supply. You can't keep making it. The blood, sweat and tears required to produce this ounce of gold is the background to one of the most exciting stories ever filmed. The gold here is a store of value. But there is another through line between the stones of rye, wampum and gold bullion. That through line is energy. Gold, historically, has been the way that we transport the fruits of our labor across space and time. 
So humanity would exchange their physical labor, the fruits of their intellectual output, the fruits of their physical output, um, for, for these shiny rocks, effectively for gold. That allowed us to transport value that we created across vast distances of space and time. Gold could do this because of what the cryptographer Nick Zabo calls unforgeable costliness. It takes a huge amount of energy to get this metal out of the earth. Just as with wampum and the stones of rye, this guarantees scarcity and limited supply. Inherently, what gold is, is proof of work. We put in a ton of energy to find the gold deposits, to move tons and tons of rock in order to get grams of gold, and then refine that into condensed proof that all that work was done. That's essentially what gold is. You can carry these things around as money, knowing that the time and energy it takes to make them ensures a degree of scarcity, which preserves their value. Perhaps to foreign settlers, the time and energy expended in creating wampum, and indeed it was a major industry for some native tribes, seemed wasteful and ridiculous. Yet it was energy the Native Americans considered well spent in service of producing reliable money, money which held its value absent any central authority. Creating money can seem like a waste uh, to people who are not familiar with the needs that money serves. But once you have an established form of money, that actually increases the efficiency of most other economic transactions. What you put in in one area of energy, you basically save often several times over in, in another part of the economy. And that's often the part that's missed when outside observers look at commodity money or other types of money and, and find it to be wasteful or arbitrary. The natives wouldn't waste time making money if people didn't need it. And if people needed it, the effort expended in making it was not wasted. Natives drilling seashells or hewing stone, or miners laboring at a rock face. The energy expended is simply and purely proportionate to the value people get from using it. And little is as useful as money, one of the key human tools in supporting civilizational coordination and organization. In 1971, the US dollar broke its formal link with gold, but it was still to remain inextricably linked with energy. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. We must protect the dollar from the attacks of international money speculators. Following this announcement, the US made a deal with Saudi Arabia. The global oil market would be denominated in and conducted with dollars ensuring a constant global demand for the currency. There were two sides to the system. One was simply that the Saudis would agree to price oil sales in dollars, and later that would lead the rest of OPEC to also price the oil in dollars. On the American side, we agreed to protect the Saudis and sell them an inordinate amount of weapons, essentially, and like preserve their role geopolitically in the Middle East. Doesn't this mean a change in the world balance of power between the developing nations like you, the producers, and us, the developed industrialized nations? Yes, it will. You have to adjust yourself to the new circumstances. And I think you have to sit down and talk seriously with us about this new era. That allowed the dollar to retain global relevance and to double down at a time when its, its future was very much in question. So this was hugely helpful for the elites in the US, at least. And that was the petrodollar system. But this commitment to protect and police the Persian Gulf created a massive new energy overhead for the US dollar. If you look at the petrodollar fundamentally, it's really backed by the US military. And the US military burns 4.8 billion gallons of fuel a year <laughs> to protect the petrodollar. So there is a massive cost there, and there is a massive environmental footprint. But you rarely hear anybody talking about that, if at all. So a single stealth fighter jet costs $1 billion. And on an average flight, I believe it will burn around 16,000 gallons of fuel. The United States owns hundreds of these. And they fly all the time on practice missions, on actual missions. An aircraft carrier burns tremendous amounts of energy. But if we think about just the vast scale of the petro-industrial war machine 
and the amount of human life that has cost, the amount of ecological devastation we have seen as a result of Western nation states bombing the shit out of third world countries to maintain their access to cheap oil, it just absolutely pales in comparison. And because it ties the interests of the United States to oil, the petrodollar system may well have functioned to preserve not only the dollar, but also oil production itself, one of the most polluting forms of energy. Would we have evolved away from the oil industry faster, were its interests not entwined with those of the US dollar? We have central bankers going on television saying they are concerned about the ESG footprint of the crypto mining ecosystem when they are flying around the world on private jets and using taxpayer dollars to subsidize a highly developed multi-trillion dollar oil and gas industry in order to maintain the petrodollar status quo. Those two things are ideologically incompatible. And this brings us to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is one of the only industries that is extremely transparent about its energy usage which I think makes it an easy target. What this transparency means is that unlike almost any other industry, we have a pretty good idea of the Bitcoin network's energy use. Our best guess is around 100 to 150 terawatt hours of electricity per year. And this comes from making an informed guess as to the kinds of machines that are active on the Bitcoin network and their energy consumption. This is an estimate that is relatively uncontroversial. The Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance is generally considered to be the most credible source on this, and that's the range that they're projecting or looking at. At this point, it's still rounding error, 0.1% of global energy usage. And yet, Bitcoin's very transparency means this minuscule slice of energy has received disproportionate media attention. Bitcoin takes enormous amounts of energy to digitally mine. We have warned at the Financial Times now for many months that cryptocurrency is filthy. It costs a lot in terms of energy. Probably a small country is the total usage. It is projected to consume as much energy as all the data centers in the whole world this year. But judging by precedent, using a great deal of energy is in itself not a crime. The cruise ship industry uses 250 terawatt hours a year, more than twice the energy of the Bitcoin network. And as far back as 2016, the online advertising industry was already using around 106 terawatt hours, a huge amount of which was spam. And in Americans' own households, always on devices, use 1,375 terawatt hours a year, 12.1 times that of Bitcoin's consumption expended for the convenience of having a thing respond instantly rather than after a few seconds. Some might say Christmas lights are a terrible use of energy. Christmas lights in the United States alone consume more power than the entirety of the Bitcoin network. Yet we don't have an energy police that's banning the use of Christmas lights because people are willing to, to pay to use electricity in that way. The implication is that the value of the Bitcoin network must be less than luxury cruises, Christmas lights, or a nation of Alexas listening in for our next command. But even if Bitcoin's social value does rival that of Christmas lights, why make miners burn energy to earn Bitcoin? Why should a digital currency have to use up any physical resources at all? For the answer, we need to return to the shell belts of the Native Americans, to gold. A layer of rich ore which produces 8 million ounces of gold a year. And to the carved rice stones of Micronesia. Bitcoin is part of a rich history of currencies that have embedded proof of energy, proof of work done over time, as a strategy to secure their value. Bitcoin actually approximates what money always was in a better way than just about any other type of money that humans have ever found. It's essentially a ledger system combined with this proof of work element. Wampum could only be created by spending time and energy, and that effort was proof of the value it had to its makers. In the same way, Bitcoin is rewarded only when a miner can prove that they have done a certain amount of work. This requires electricity. Embedded in each Bitcoin, like a bar of gold or a string of shells, is proof that this work was done. No state or authority has ever instructed or forced anyone to mine Bitcoin. 
Mining is an activity carried out by individuals in response to the organic emerging demand for Bitcoin. Every day, tens of thousands of people are choosing, and the critical word here is choosing, to join the Bitcoin network, to engage in the Bitcoin economy. And I think that's where the energy use arguments become really spurious and difficult to follow. You know, Bitcoin is not a corporation. There's no top level organization deciding how much energy the Bitcoin network should use. Instead, it's this quilt of millions of decisions by millions of actors in the ecosystem. And so really, it's, it's the miners are following what the market's doing in terms of millions of people wanting to use Bitcoin for a variety of different purposes, whether it's storing value, whether it's making payments. And so miners are adapting to that market demand constantly. There are a group of people around the world who have decided that for them, Bitcoin has value. That's subjective, that's not objective. So attempts to qualify or quantify that feeling people have, I think is a fool's errand. Why then criticize Bitcoin's energy use and not that of other currencies? Perhaps, again, because Bitcoin has such a transparent and direct relationship with energy. Gold, shells, and carved stones each require several stages of human and mechanical processing to render them as money. Bitcoin mining requires electricity, processors, and code. And of those, electricity is more or less the only factor miners can exploit to increase the amount of Bitcoin they earn. The image of thousands of Bitcoin miners wasting energy is far less romantic than that of native women preparing shell belts or miners going west in search of fortune. The gold shines and like that. Struck it, Kurt. Perhaps it's even anti-romantic, but at root it's the same proof of work, scaling up in real time to meet the demands of an emergent market distributed across the entire world and made possible by the internet. What essentially Bitcoin is, is a currency of energy. Work put into the blockchain is the arbiter of truth. Why is gold worth some 20 bucks an ounce? I don't know, because it's scarce. A thousand men say go searching for gold. After six months, one of them's lucky, one out of the thousand. His find represents not only his own labor, but that of 999 others to boot. That's uh, 6,000 months or 500 years, scrabbling over mountains, going hungry and thirsty. Not to gold, mister, is worth what it is because of the human labor that went into the finding and the getting of it. Never thought of it just like that. Well, there's no other explanation, mister. Gold and stuff ain't good for nothing except for making jewelry with gold teeth. <laughs> so what is the consequence of a currency whose production and value is so closely tied to energy? Let's recap. Bitcoin miners need to find low-cost energy to get an edge. And despite state coal subsidies in some countries, this now mostly means efficient, clean energy. Wind, solar, and especially hydro, but also flared natural gas, even geothermal. Because of the way incentives work with miners, they have a direct incentive to find the cheapest energy available. And in a lot of cases, the cheapest energy is renewables. We've been seeing miners for the last decade increasingly shift towards cheaper sources of energy, which have been renewable. The industry is not specifically regulated to emit a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions per Bitcoin mine. They've been shifting towards renewables because it makes economic sense. More than two thirds of the energy produced in the world is waste energy because it's produced during the hours of the day when there's not demand to consume it. And it's also produced in a place where there's not transmission to move it across space and time. And so that energy goes unused and wasted. It is a misnomer that Bitcoin is using all the energy of a country like Switzerland, for example. That may be technically true, but that's not the real story. You have to peel one layer of the onion back and realize that a lot of the energy that the Bitcoin network is consuming is waste energy that otherwise was not available to be consumed. This is why the Bitcoin industry was so excited when the president of El Salvador announced the availability of unexploited thermal energy from one of the country's dormant volcanoes. Here was a cheap, stranded input which could provide an edge in the race to mint new Bitcoin. El Salvador's latent natural energy may soon create a significant percentage of the next decade's supply of new Bitcoin, and Salvadorians themselves stand to benefit. 
specifically of where these volcanoes happen to be and where these hydro plants happen to be and where these wind and solar farms happen to be in various countries, often they're far away from population centers. So what this will allow is electrification of new areas and creating new economic activity. So for El Salvador, you're looking at these communities in the mountains or by the rivers that can get a jump start with economic activity. And once there's like Bitcoin mining, there's other stuff. Oh, those people need food. There might be some housing, new communities. So just like mankind developed along rivers in our history, maybe we'll start to develop more activity around Bitcoin mining. Once an industry begins to grow, there's a whole ecosystem that builds around it. It's not just the miners, it's the skilled workers working around energy systems, electricians. It's the businesses supporting it, whether that's on the manufacturing side or on the skills side. For the Congo, only 9% of the population out of like 90 million people have access to the grid. And that causes an enormous amount of deforestation because they get their energy basically from biofuels by cutting down trees and producing charcoal. It creates also a lot of indoor air pollution, which kills a lot of children. And it's, it's just a disaster all around. So if all of a sudden you had 90% using hydroelectricity instead of biofuels, man, that would be a massive difference maker, both for the environment, both for people, both for, for everybody. And Bitcoin can help us get there. Because Bitcoin miners are always on the hunt for clean, efficient energy, renewables already account for 39% of the Bitcoin network's energy use, a number that's increasing all the time against a general energy mix of just 11% renewable. The cleanest types of energy are also the lowest cost types of energy because it's the most efficient types of energy. If Bitcoin is able to make those types of energy even more cost effective, it should actually help to promote renewable energy development, whether it's clean types of nuclear energy, appropriately placed solar energy, and whether it's hydroelectric energy. By making all those types of energy sources more efficient, it can actually strongly incentivize the growth of renewable energy in a way that some of our prior attempts, our top-down attempts, haven't been able to do very effectively. Cheap power is cheap because it is efficient. It is efficient because there is less waste in turning it into a useful form. And less waste means less carbon less pollution, less negative externalities. Captured today, the ocean caught fire in the Gulf of Mexico, just west of the Yucatan Peninsula. As we have seen, Bitcoin, like shells and gold, uses energy as a means to establish value. But unlike those other monies, Bitcoin's demand for the most efficient power pushes miners to innovate, obtaining power which is either wasted, like trapped methane, stranded, like remote volcanoes, or simply efficient and therefore clean. In contrast with gold, the search for which leads to more dirty, wasteful mines, the search for Bitcoin appears to lead to greener and more efficient energy production. I think volcano mining is very interesting because you have this energy source and it may not make sense to tap it for some use cases, but Bitcoin miners are very mobile. We can move to where the power is. You can set up your mining facility very close to the source of power generation. So it could be on the volcano. That's something that is unique to Bitcoin mining. You know, normally when you generate power, you need to move it somewhere else. You need to move it to the city or to industrial facilities or somewhere. But for mining, we are able to go where that power is. It's a very interesting use case to tap into their natural energy sources and leverage it for Bitcoin mining. Consider that since 1992, the year of the Rio Climate Summit, top-down attempts to transition the world to cleaner energy have fallen astonishingly short of their targets as CO2 levels have continued to rise. These figures show how the carbon credit system these meetings implemented has proved substantially ineffective. Each year, companies are allocated a carbon allowance, which can then be bought and sold via a market. If a company goes over its allowance, it can just buy a bigger allocation, permitting it to continue business as usual. By contrast, Bitcoin has created a market incentive to do exactly what is now almost certainly necessary, find and release the vast amounts of clean, efficient energy we need to bring a better life to more people while maintaining a habitable planet. And Bitcoin does this not because it seeks virtue or because it wants access to subsidies, but because the search for cheap power is the search for clean power. But it goes further. As in the case of El Salvador's volcano power, the guaranteed income from Bitcoin mining makes possible the huge capital expenditure required 
to set up new sustainable power plants. It's de-risking construction of renewable energy facilities. It's de-risking it because it is willing to buy 24-7, 365. And when you have a predictable buyer, predictable revenue stream, it's easy to plan out your operations and that certainty means that that site gets built. One thing that you find, especially in emerging markets, but also with new types of energy in developed markets, is that they're building out this proof of concept. They don't necessarily have the electricity infrastructure, the distribution infrastructure to get that energy to where it needs to be. You know, it's a long distance from population centers. And so you have kind of a chicken and the egg problem where you can't really build that electricity production until you have distribution infrastructure, which is very expensive. We also can't build that infrastructure until you are sure that you have some sort of demand in place to make that whole project profitable. And so what we see with Bitcoin miners is that they can help bootstrap new types of energy or established types of energy in new locations, especially developing locations. Something similar is happening in Wyoming, Texas and Alberta, where oil rigs flare off huge quantities of waste methane. Bitcoin miners are moving in to capture this methane with portable mining equipment. Imagine if you wheel it into a oil field that's just flaring the natural gas because they're not collecting it, they're just flaring it into the atmosphere. You can't live in this smell. Well, it's just like an airplane passing through. And the energy that's generated is used to mine Bitcoin. I'm noticing that the oil wells that used to have orange flares at night, you'd be driving and you'd see them in the distance and that was flaring the natural gas, the methane that's coming out from the oil production process, both at plants and also at the wells themselves. And now you start to see that they're gone. And the reason is, in most cases, that Bitcoin miners have cut deals with whoever owns the oil well to capture the flared energy, to turn the turbine, to create the power to run the Bitcoin miner. And you see these little huts that have popped up next to the oil wells. And uh, that's where there's a Bitcoin miner inside. Most folks probably don't even realize that when they look at them. Not only are we taking that natural gas and using it as electricity, we can capture the carbon, okay? You're not venting the carbon dioxide and creating acid rain and CO2. We capture it, we put it underground. Like there's just so many environmental benefits. So in that case, yeah, we are cleaning the environment. All energy that's stranded and wasted now potentially has a home and now it can potentially get rescued. And so portable Bitcoin mines, right? A portable building that can house Bitcoin ASICs and be modular, right? You can move it around relatively easy and you can set it up and, and connect it into any primary energy source, whether it's hydroelectric or solar or wind or natural gas and be able to effectively create a market for that energy uh, right there on the spot, anywhere in the world with an internet connection. That's really Bitcoin's killer app. Flared methane alone could power the Bitcoin network many times over. And by doing so, Bitcoin would become not just carbon neutral, but carbon negative. Look, it's a massive environmental benefit. This is a benefit to air quality all around the world, and it's a serious problem. So Bitcoin should be celebrated. Consider this question. How many other stranded or wasted resources does Bitcoin make it possible to tap? Could Bitcoin be the engine that will release an exponential wave of clean power generation. The wave we need to advance our civilization. What will be the marginal consumer of energy to get to those projects that become economically viable? I think it'll be Bitcoin. So good, good, good. And this is why we can truly call Bitcoin a greening machine, a system with the potential to explode the growth of renewable energy. As we have seen, the energy expended in creating Bitcoin is one of the key ways it establishes its value. But that same energy, the work in proof of work, also secures the Bitcoin network, helping to create a true money of the public outside the control of any one intermediary. No government or billionaire or gang can corrupt or control Bitcoin, and all attempts to do so have so far failed dismally. Bitcoin, the Indian government is quite likely to ban it pretty soon, or at least that is what the government says. Bitcoin is under pressure after Turkey banned using that as payments. Bitcoin will go to zero. China's stepping up on its crackdown on Bitcoin mining as the reality of... But what does it matter that Bitcoin has survived all these attacks? What is the point of a money without intermediaries? In short, 
It is a money that can function when those intermediaries become unreliable or corrupt. Okay. Across the world, trust in institutions, from authority figures to governments to media and politicians. Alternative facts. Even science and medicine is failing. But even as this decay of trust has become deeper, Western central banks have relied on our faith and credit to print trillions of dollars to support a frail and inequitable system. Just getting word from the Federal Reserve. Bombshell announcement from the Federal Reserve. It is an absolutely historic week, both in terms of the speed of Fed purchases and, of course, the magnitude. How long can they expect to keep our trust? In the grocery store, at the gas pump, on the car lot, prices keep rising. In the U.S., there is virtually no collective memory of times of high inflation because the last time we saw this in America was in the 70s. And so there's not that many people alive today that really deeply remember what it's like. The Labor Department reported Thursday that consumer prices jumped 5% over the past year. That's the highest inflation rate in the U.S. since 2008. You write in a new piece for CNN that inflation has actually surpassed wages and unemployment as the public's top concern about the economy and that the White House can't actually do much about it. So what's the plan? If you look at our fiscal and monetary situation here, we're talking 25 plus percent year over year growth in the money supply. This looks like wartime finance. This was the similar framing that we had after and during World War II, after which we had a period of monetary repression. In America, we've experienced inflation for the past dozen years. Inflation caused by government debt and easy credit policies which cut the value of our dollar nearly in half. People don't remember what it's like to have inflation, but that kind of looks like what we're headed towards. Wealthy Venezuelan families saw their fortunes disappear, and the poor were pushed even further into desperation. A tragedy is unfolding in Lebanon. Inflation has driven the country's currency to historical lows. An economic crisis that the World Bank says will likely rank among the world's worst of the last 150 years. All the people are hungry. No one has anything to eat. There's no electricity in our homes. Children need milk and no one can afford to buy it. That's why we're here. We often look at things from a privileged perspective, but a lot of people in a lot of different locations don't have access to efficient payment systems, reliable currency. The majority of people still live in authoritarian regimes in one way or another. The ability to have permissionless money that has a fixed supply cap to it is actually pretty useful for a lot of people in the world. People that suffer under authoritarian regimes, they definitely appreciate the merit of a system that allows you to store your life's output, your labor, your capital, and your time in a medium that is not controlled by the state. And that's a very simple case to make. It's one that I have to make to Westerners and Americans that don't appreciate this. It's one that I don't have to make to Argentines, Nigerians, Venezuelans, Colombians, Kenyans, people living in former Soviet Union countries, authoritarian states or countries that are suffering double or triple digit inflation. We're talking billions of people here. We've seen huge corrections in traditional financial systems. Dating back 50 years, it seems like we're on a cadence where every certain number of years, sometimes it's five years, sometimes it's 10 years, there's an enormous crash. It started in stocks in the early 70s, then it was commodities with oil, then it was interest rates, and then going to the 1987 stock market crash. The law of gravity hit Wall Street today, and as stock prices plunged even more than they did on Black Tuesday of 1929. And we saw it in real estate. It's just kind of whack-a-mole. What you seem to be saying is that there is a very predictable time bomb effect here. Exactly. The 90s, a bond market correction, then we had the, the Russian default. <laughs> And then we had the internet bubble. This money machine, the internet, the information technology revolution, it's a hell of a mouthful to say. When you're on top of that wave and you're surfing, you got to ride it to the end. That led to the housing bubble, and a lot of it is the responses of central banks to the previous crashes, where they'll just try to smooth things over by expanding their balance sheets and pushing credit into the economy. The Federal Reserve has moved quickly to... Uh 
bring order to the financial markets. There are some concerns about the stability of traditional systems because we've lived it. And what I like about Bitcoin is the systemic stability. It's almost at a Six Sigma quality control level in terms of network uptime. Bitcoin as a piece of software is unbelievably stable. While we look at the traditional financial system where fiat currencies may for now appear more stable. The increases will happen than Bitcoin. We're not saying they will reverse. That's not what transitory means. But the underlying systems may not be as stable as Bitcoin. So there will be inflation, but the process of inflation uh, will stop. That's what I think a lot of folks are sensing, and that it, it is a hedge against systemic instability. Bitcoin, crucially, is premised not on trust in legacy institutions, but on math and energy. It has the potential to render obsolete what may be the least environmentally friendly institution of all time, the petrodollar. Bitcoin requires no warplanes to sustain it, no Middle East peace wars, no drone fleets, no multi-billion dollar armament deals. Like the internet itself, it just works. A green machine and a peer-to-peer -peer protocol for money in the network age. The F-35 will only ever run on jet fuel. It's never going to be clean, ever. Whereas Bitcoin plugs into the wall and whatever's on the other side of that plug is what Bitcoin is. And it won't be long, not more than a decade max, where Bitcoin is 100% powered by renewables and waste. This conversation, really the fundamentals of it, is people that think Bitcoin is useful versus people who think Bitcoin is not useful. If you think it's useful and appreciate its use cases, you quickly realize that its energy consumption is nothing. And on the contrary, I worry about the energy consumption being too low. I want to go to sleep knowing that somebody has to overtake the Argentinian grid to manipulate my money. I probably won't be happy until Bitcoin uses as much energy as America. We're still a fair ways away from that, but that's when I'll be truly happy knowing that Bitcoin, like, no one can touch it.